Well, 2021 is almost over and it was another strange year because of uh, the C word, uh, same as last year. But uh, again, there were some fantastic movies this year, not just horror, but uh, we're going to do the top 10 best horror movies of the year, 2021. Let's go. What's up, guys? Another year's behind us. I'm excited. We're going to do the top 10 best horror movies of the year. And I will say, the list that I'm about to give you, including two honorable mentions, is not all of the good or even the great. There's some really good horror movies out there this year. So I would urge you that, like, maybe after this list, go look at my letterbox and you can see that uh, there was just a lot of good stuff. I could probably do another top 10, which maybe I'll do that. I'll give you 10 more good horror movies of 2021. So yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to do that. I'll probably do that. But anyway, I'm going to give you my 10 favorite, okay? This, this, this is ranked, all right? This is 10 to 1. And I'm going to start you off with two honorable mentions. First honorable mention is going to be Censor. Uh, I really like this movie for a couple reasons. It definitely had like an Italian horror type feel to it. Um, and also I liked that it dealt with, you know, the, the Censor board from the UK or what we would call over here the MPAA. You know, uh, back in the 80s, there were a lot of video nasties that were put on the back burner. You know, they were they were even given like an X rating, and especially in the UK. And so this isn't a documentary. This is a movie about a character who lost a loved one, and so she works for this ratings board, and that ties into the plot of the movie. But uh, beautiful to look at, too. You know, I, I really love that Italian horror aesthetic. And I've seen a lot more movies pop up over the past couple of years that have been honoring that subgenre of horror. And it's awesome. And this is definitely a very good one. They're very thought provoking too. And next honorable mention is gonna be Violation. It's from Shudder. And this one was one of those that's really freaking serious and it, it can be depressing and deep. And involves a character that, you know, she goes on this excursion with some friends, just, you know, four of them. And what do you do when one of your really good friends who you trust takes advantage of a situation. And let me tell you, this movie gets dark and it goes down some crazy paths. There's some shocking scenes in the movie. And if you're looking for some shock value, definitely check out Violation on Shudder. Really good movie too. So now let's jump into the top 10. Number 10, Dark and the Wicked. We were just talking about like really heavy, deep stuff. <laughs> this is another one of those movies. Deals with religion you know, evil. If you're looking for like evil movies, this is definitely the one for you. It's also like a highbrow type horror movie as well. Directed phenomenally. It has like an A24 feel to it, but it involves just the death of a family member. But I do like movies that kind of poke at your own belief systems, maybe throw some horror in the mix. And this one definitely does that. And it's got some controversial shit going on. I really liked it. Number nine, let's get more mainstream. A Quiet Place 2. I really enjoyed this one. I went in with the lowest expectations because I will say, I thought the first one, a bit overrated. A bit overrated. That doesn't mean the first one wasn't good. It's good. You know, the emotional moments in the movie are what make it. You know, the John Krasinski, that, that moment at the end of the movie is beautiful. Not taking anything away, but I, I thought the creatures in that movie were um, a little forgettable. You know, it's stuff that we've seen before. So surprisingly, they handled the creatures better in this movie and I, I found myself more interested about the way they handled them. I loved Killian Murphy in the movie and I just thought there was a lot going on in this one and I think the stakes were raised a little bit with the baby. You know, of course I was calling bullshit like that baby would have been freaking been gone within, you know, the first like 10 minutes of the movie. But uh, hey, it raises the tension, right? And I think this movie had a lot of tension. It was very well directed by John Krasinski, too. Number eight, Saint Maud. Uh, this is another one. I think this one is an A24 movie. This is another one of those that pushes buttons, you know, with the religion. And what I like about Saint Maud is you have this character that is finding her faith, and she's so devoted to it that she takes a, a hospice job as a nurse out of a will to do good for the for the sake of her belief. You know, she is a Christian, but there are elements like dark, I guess evil type elements that present themselves in this movie that make her question things. And it really goes down some interesting paths, but the thing that stuck out to me is just the way it's directed. There's some beautiful, challenging imagery 
uh, in the last act of this. And you can tell when a director is really swinging for the fences in his artistic expression, and this really does that. And I'd say this is the one that like stayed with me the most. Like I couldn't stop thinking about it after I watched it. You know, this I think holds the title for that this year. Number seven, Candyman. You know, we have been waiting for a Candyman sequel. I guess a, a legitimate sequel since the first movie that came out, you know, 30 years ago. And this is a sequel. It's not a remake like a lot of people thought it was going to be. I like that this one didn't pretty much copy what the original did. It's a very updated version. And I could compare it to, to movies like The Fly because there's like a metamorphosis that goes on with this. But also I just like how this main character that he has a tie to the original movie and he starts investigating this whole Candyman story. And what I love about this movie is it really dives into that Candyman lore. And there's some horrific moments in this too. Uh, like I like how Nia DaCosta got so creative in the way she handled the deaths and the kills in this. Like, you know, the, the makeup mirror scene in the bathroom. That's just one example, but uh, had a, I love this ending, and I think this ending is very controversial. I even like got into it on my channel, made a video explaining why this movie isn't what you would call woke. Like that term really gets under my skin these days. Yes, woke content does happen, but there is this audience that seems to take the word and apply it to everything when that's just not the case, especially with this movie. Number six, Blood Red Sky. This is a movie that was on Netflix. It's a German movie. I like a good vampire movie. And I, I like that the, the genre tends to poke its big toe into so many different uh, eras of horror. You, you know, you can really play around with the vampire subgenre. And I like that this one put, like what if you put a vampire on a plane? And this is a character that's trying to control the urge, you know? the thirst, and you have these hijackers on the plane, it gets insane, okay? And like my favorite scene is early in the movie when she's just sitting there and the hijackers just walking by and you know, she's like shaking. Like, I want to kill this guy like right now. I like that this movie in the third act goes to some directions that I didn't expect it to. It's really bloody. If you're looking for some nice bloody vampire action, then this is definitely your movie. And it's got a nice, you know, uh, mother trying to protect her son you know, kind of like what we got in Train to Busan. This is, I guess this is this year's Train to Busan. Number five, Fear Street. This trilogy uh, really surprised the hell out of me. I, I'm putting 78 on the list. This will be the only one on the list. 78 is definitely the best, but I like that all three of the movies really um, came together. You know, the first one takes place in 94, and then I was like, how are they gonna jump to 78? But then, you know, you understand once you get to the end of that movie and all of it comes together in the last movie. But 78, I think, was just the funnest because it definitely had that 80s slasher vibe to it. But by this time, you're already invested in the characters, which I think was a genius move. You know, some great kills. They have a few different killers in this. And I think if you have a good killer, that just gives the movie a leg up. And this movie had a few killers in it uh, that kind of spread out throughout the whole thing. Like Ruby Lane was one that I was really interested in and you only get like a, a peek at her in this movie. This was more of like the, the sackhead killer. But I mean, if you're looking for a good fun slasher this year, Fear Street, really the whole trilogy, but 78 really packs a punch. Now, if you're like a diehard fan of the books, don't expect a direct uh, representation of those in these movies. Not that at all, but uh, I'd never read the books anyway, so I had a blast with it. Number four, Night House. This movie was fantastic, and I like that it dealt with grief. You know, right at the beginning of the movie, uh, you have this character, Rebecca Hall, and her husband kills himself. And so I think as far as like the best performances of the year, Rebecca Hall would probably win. Her performance in this movie is so good, but it's really nuanced. And it's not what you would expect, you know, because how do we grieve? Everybody grieves in different ways. And I liked her interpretation of grief in this movie. This one is one that you could compare to like Invisible Man because there is an aspect of that to it. But the last act definitely surprised me and went into places that I didn't expect because I had my own predictions as to where the last act would go. And it pretty much went the opposite which I loved. Number three, Malignant. And this is one of those movies that was the most debated. Like I saw people state that this was like their least favorite movie of the year. 
So I guess it's just one of those movies, either you like it or you don't. And one thing I love is that James Wan really swung for the fences with this premise. And I went into this thinking it was gonna be like your normal supernatural ghost type of film. I mean, I was excited that James Wan was doing it. So I guess I'm not that surprised because he usually does kind of throw um, a left hook at you. And boy, does this one. Uh, I, like, and I'm not gonna spoil it at all, but man, I love, like this is probably my favorite twist of the year. Again, like I was talking earlier with Italian Horror, this is another one of those movies that, I mean, heavily, heavily uh, honors Italian Horror. It's, I guess this is kind of like your action horror movie of the year. I had so much fun, and I didn't expect it to be like that, but probably my biggest surprise of the year, if I'm being honest. Okay, these last two, I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I've swapped these two probably four or five times now. Shit you not. It's been hard because you, if I went with what's the better made movie, it would be one of the movies. But if I go with which movie did I come out of like shouting at the mountaintops, it would be the other movie. But I'm gonna go with, I guess, the entertainment value for this list, okay? So know that going into these top two. So number two is Last Night in Soho. As far as the best made movie of the year, by far Last Night in Soho. Don't get me wrong, this beats number one, and you probably already know what number one is, but this definitely beats number one as far as like best made movie. Um, Edgar Wright, what can you say about the guy? He is uh, probably the best director in Hollywood working today. It, easily one of my favorites, just the way he is five steps ahead of every other director in terms of what to do with the camera, how to make the camera it, a character itself. And this is another one of those movies that honors Italian horror with all those great, you know, the blues and the purples. Um, it's just a visually striking film. Uh, loved the plot, you know, th this um, juxtaposition between these two characters, uh, this character that's obsessed with the 60s. Really, at the end of the day, it's a crime drama. You know, it's a mystery. She's trying to solve this mystery of this character from the 60s. And I was just completely glued to this movie from start to finish. It's wonderful. And really, it's tied for number one, but I had to, to place them appropriately. And so just know that. And so number one, Halloween Kills. And uh, I've watched Halloween Kills three times now. I feel like I have to say that every time I watch a Halloween movie. Just so you guys know, where's Lee at now with, with Halloween? Does he like this movie or not? I will say that I can't wait to watch that extended cut when it comes out. I'm gonna do a full review for the extended cut, but where I am at right now in relation to where I was with Halloween 2018 at the same point, still completely love this movie. Uh, and, and I think a lot of the things that people pick the movie apart for are the things that I get behind. I like that it was different and dealt with uh, a, a town that makes horrible decisions uh, amidst all this chaos. And I loved that Myers was two steps ahead of everybody in this. Cause I didn't expect that. Honestly, guys, I expected this movie to make the mob win and maybe Mike, Michael gets the upper hand at the end, but no, Michael was always ahead of everybody. And the town of Haddonfield just kept falling on their faces. They were complete morons throughout. And it's believable. It's completely believable because that's what happens when a uh, mob and group mentality get together and they don't stop and think for themselves. And that's, you know, you, you have that hospital that's just completely packed with people and it's chaotic. It's like Black Friday when you go to Black Friday. You know, people act like morons for the sake of saving $2. So it's kind of the same thing here, but the things that I loved about this movie were the freaking score. I think John Carpenter, Daniel Davies, and Cody Carpenter up their game. Myers, this might be my favorite Myers out of the whole franchise. He is flat out amazing in this movie. If, if you're a Myers fan, Halloween Kills is for you. I mean, wow, they swung for the fences in terms of Myers for this. James Jude Courtney, I think he's officially the best Myers now. He is amazing, gives no fucks whatsoever. And that's the Myers that I was longing for all the way back from like Halloween 6, you know? And even Halloween 4. I've always loved that uh, Thorn trilogy. Not because of the Thorn thing itself, but because of Myers in those movies. This is a Myers that was full on like supernatural 
And you know, that's a debate to be had. People say they don't like Myers Supernatural. I like it, I'm sorry. I like my Myers to be able to freaking pick people up off the ground with one hand and crack their neck. I like that stuff, you know, that's just me. No regrets whatsoever. I will watch Halloween Kills five more times and I, and I just have a, a freaking blast with it. As a matter of fact, I literally, like I, you can't see it right now, but my vinyl player is right over there, record player, whatever. I listen to the Halloween Kills soundtrack before I record every single time. It, it pumps me up. There's something about it that just really gets me going. And so by the time I sit down, I just have so much energy and adrenaline in me. It's that effective of a score. So, and it's that effective of a movie. Love Halloween Kills, can't wait for ends. So anyway guys, that's it. My top 10 favorite horror movies of 2021. Let me know your list down in the comments. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flex where we talk horror all day and every day on Fridays. We do free for all Fridays. Follow me at Drum Dumbs on all my socials. Support me on Patreon buy me a coffee. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and Drum Dumb out.